All right. Good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Jo or Joanne Cooper. Um, last week, we started off our new series called Jesus Is, and we heard from um, John and Pastor Tara. John shared on Jesus is our advocate, and Jesus is our friend. And it was incredible. It was awesome. And um, like John shared last week, he just said, you know, there's so many different um, attitudes and characters of Jesus that we can learn so much from. And I think we could continue talking about Jesus forever, and it would be awesome. So we're going to continue talking about Jesus this week. So I'm just going to pray first. So God, we thank you so much for sending Jesus. We thank you that he saved us, that we can talk about him, that he loves us, that we love him. And we just give you this morning, I pray that this will be your words, not my words, that everything I speak will be of you. In your name, amen. All right, I'm going to start off firstly with um, a verse, Matthew 11, 28 to 30. You may know it. Um, it's going to be on the screen or you can bring your Bibles and read it along for yourself. Um, Okay, so then Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your soul for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Now, I know we've heard this before, but we could forever hear it because it's awesome. So I know you don't mind me speaking on it again. So just a little background story. When Jesus said this to the crowds that he was talking to, these people had grown up under the, religious, uh, the Jewish, Jewish religious system, and this system was based on law. Everything they did, whether it was raising a family, Uh, running a business, whatever their business was, or how they even related to each other. Everything was done by law. Now, when we think of law, we automatically think of the Australian government law that we kind of come under, we abide by now. They were put into measure for us. Um, But the Jewish law was abiding by the law that Moses brought. Now, The laws that had been put over place in Australia, they're here to help us, they're here to um, keep us safe and to make things run nice and smoothly. Now, this is the same concept of why these laws were brought into place back then. Um, Hundreds of years ago, through Moses, God gave the Israelites a series of laws that dealt with religion, morale, um, and practical issues. It was designed to help maintain a high moral standard and was God's provision to help people live better lives. Now, I'm sure you've heard of the Ten Commandments. Even if you haven't been to church, people seem to know these these commandments, these ten in particular. Um, These were the most famous commandments given to the Israelites. Uh, But they're not the only ones that the Israelites were living by. There was many, many more, hundreds if not. Um, Yeah, a long list of commandments that touched on every single aspect of life. Again, this was designed so people could live a better life. It was there so that they could uh, know what to do. They didn't have to worry and try and do it on themselves. The laws were there and put into place, so all was going to be well. But (laughs) this law um, was put into place and was demanded by every single person. They, They had to abide by it, and if they didn't, they were guilty of sin. Now... As we know, we're all guilty of sin, and we always will be guilty of sin. And so in order to counteract their sin, they had to continually give animal sacrifices to cover that sin. So if we relate that to this day and age where we live now, we have a lot of, we have a lot of laws. Now, I'm sure I don't know all of them, and hopefully I don't break too many of them. But um, <laughs> now I would say I'm generally a pretty good person. I like to stick to the law, I'm a fan of the law, I love the law and I love rules. I, I love it, it's the best. But um, yes, yeah, so I appreciate why they were put into place, I understand it, but, and I like to stick to it the best I can. But see, this is where my husband and myself differ. Um, I really love the law, whereas John, he abides by it, but he doesn't necessarily love it, and he definitely likes to push the boundaries. So, now I know, for an example, this was just Friday night, we went bowling. Now, I don't think this is, you could really call it a law, but when we're talking about rules, even the unwritten rules, I'm all for them, I stand by them, and I hate it when they're broken. So, we were bowling, and uh, you know when you 
going down and you happen to get a split, so one pin on this side and one pin on that side, and it's impossible pretty much to get both of them down. Now, someone was going for it and thought, I'm going to put two balls down. In my mind, I'm like, oh my gosh, this isn't what you do. We're going to kick out. This is the end. I'm never going to be going bowling ever in my life. Like, this is, this is it. You, you just can't do that. There are rules in place for a reason. Now, that was my initial thought. It was on the boys' team. So I just turned my eyes away and thought, I'm not going to be a part of this. John, on the other hand, it cuts down. Someone goes, I don't think you can do that. And John goes, hey, I dare you to put three down the next go. <laughs> and so, of course, I'm going, oh, my gosh, John, don't put three down. We will definitely be kicked out. But, um, yeah, he, he, see, I don't know if that's really a law, but to me it is. You just don't break those kind of things. Um, but, yeah, so even though I love the law, I don't necessarily keep them all the time. I really try to, but there's one in particular that I, I kind of just disregard, jaywalking. I don't know if that's a thing here, but in Perth, jaywalking, you can't cross the road unless there's a traffic light or you can't go on the diagonal. I think that's a silly law. If I'm going to cross the road, I'm going to go, as long as it's safe, whatever. But apparently that's a law and I'm, I apologise and I'll try harder. I won't jaywalk as often. Um, another thing is speeding. Now, I know I'm not the only one that speeds here. I, again, I hate, I hate breaking the rules, but sometimes I just really, I'm running late. Now, I've, I've got the law. <laughs> so I've got the law, which is don't speed. This is the speed limit. It's there to provide safety, you know, so you don't go outside of that. You don't kill someone. It's a really important law. I really, I, I understand why it's there. Now, I've kind of added some rules onto that law for myself. So I then go from... Yes, that's the law. If I have, for my job, I transport a lot of clients and a lot of people. Whenever I have someone else in my car, I don't speed. It is not worth it. It's my job. It's my livelihood. It's everything. You know, I'm like, it's just so not worth it if I'm speeding. So that's a rule for me. But if I'm by myself and I'm really, really running late, I kind of justify in my head, I need to get there. I'm going to speed. But I won't go 10 k's. I won't go more than 10 k's over because when I go more than 10 k's, it really stresses me out and I think, oh, I'm going to die. So <laughs> 10 is where my limit is. But if we're being honest, just because I've made these rules up in my head doesn't mean that's the law. I've justified it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's the law. Now, if I get pulled up by a policeman and he goes, oh, I'm really sorry, you know, you're going 9 k's over, I'm going to give you a ticket. If I try and justify it, hey, look, I'm by myself, I was only going 9 k's over, uh, you know, I've got, I wasn't going too fast, like, please, you know, I'm really running late. He's still going to give me a ticket, whether I want to or not. I've justified in my head, but still, the law says I can't go one kilometre over, well, maybe one, but, you know, I can't go that much over, otherwise, you know, you, you have to face the consequences. So, to make things harder for the Jews, they added a few hundred extra laws um, leading to the time up to Jesus. Now, these laws were not given by Jesus. They were self-appointed laws. They had been written themselves. Um, they were put in place by people and written by people. So, these were kind of actually just traditions. They weren't necessarily law that had to have been abided by, but it was the Pharisees' self-appointed duty to interpret and to apply this law to everyone. That's why you wanted to be a Pharisee, so then you could apply the law. You could say, you're all wrong. But unfortunately for the Israelites, they found themselves living a rule-based life instead of living a grace-based life. Now, this wasn't God's intention at all, but it's just human nature. Now, I've put on these little rules to my extra laws, and I don't even notice that I've done them, but I have. It's just who we are. We kind of justify things in our head, and we change things around to suit, them, to suit our lives. Now, they were stuck living on tradition, things that are not the law, but are drilled into us, and pretty much it's happened for so long that we think this is it. Now, I'm not saying tradition is bad, because some tradition is good, but if it controls us, then we've kind of missed the point of what the tradition is if it doesn't align with God's laws. Now, let's jump forward to when Jesus was around. Uh, these people were really tired. They were stressed. They were worn out. They'd been trying to please God for their whole lives. They were so caught up on trying to be good that they could never actually really enjoy God anyway. They never measured up 
and, although, and thought they needed a little bit more holiness or a few more good deeds to be accepted by him. Just like Pastor Tara said last week, you know, sometimes we have this view of God that he's an accuser, that you know, he's going to come and give us a punishment and tell us what we've done wrong and here's your consequence. So when Jesus came, claimed to be God, yet wasn't handcuffing anyone, wasn't stoning anyone to death, but was loving people, accepting people, healing people, and giving them free, free reign to God, you could imagine the confusion these people were experiencing. Now here they've been spending their entire lives trying to follow every single rule and every single law to get closer to God. They were striving on their own efforts and actions to try and save themselves. You know, sometimes I find it funny that we, that we have the Bible, this book in front of us, you know, and it has every single thing we need to know. It's got stories just like this one. It's got thousands of other stories that go and tell us about people that have done things in the past, what happened to that and how they... And we see, you know, in hindsight, oh, that would have been a good idea, but they didn't know that then but we do. You know, we have the honour and the privilege of having the Bible right in front of us, telling us every single thing that we really could ever need to know, yet we still kind of strive for our own acceptance. We still kind of try and do a few more good deeds or serve a little bit more or do a little bit more in order to, to be accepted by God. Now, I've heard of the saying, or well, I don't know if it's a saying, but whatever it is, you know, Sometimes you have to make your own mistakes in order to grow from them. Now, I, I agree with that statement in some settings, but not in all settings. I've heard many people say it before, and I go, really? You can see a, a few other people have done that before you, and it turned out badly for everyone. If you do the same thing, I'm going to tell you now, it's going to turn out badly. But some people go, nah, I've got to make my own mistakes. Now, yeah, sometimes in life you do have to make your own mistakes, because we're people and we think we can do everything. <laughs> but, you know, we, we actually can't. Now, we have the Bible, and they've told us the mistakes that happened. They told us what could have happened, and then we see where it came from. Now, we are... Uh, let's try and... Yeah, let's not... Let's save ourselves the heartache, the, the pain, the time, the energy on trying to prove these things or trying to do these things ourselves when in actual fact we know they're not going to work out. We know that no matter how many times we try and do a good deed for God, it's not going to get us that little bit closer to God because that's not how it works. So let's save ourselves that and let's read the word and go, okay, these mistakes have already been made. Let's try and avoid them. Now, I think we can easily fall into the same trap of the Israelites adding rules um, to their laws. We get so caught up on doing something a particular way or carrying something that isn't ours to carry. But in, my, but in our minds, we have to do it. Uh, life can be exhausting, both physically and emotionally and spiritually. Church can be exhausting. Serving can be exhausting, you know. But Jesus came to change everything for those Israelites and for us as well. You know, he said they could find rest in him. This is a huge breath of fresh air for the Israelites. You know, this verse changed everything for them. It isn't just a nice saying of, don't worry, I've got this, I'll do it for you, you know, whatever. It's literally, you find your rest in me. That was incredibly life-altering for them. Everything they've been taught is now contradicted by the one who called himself God. Everything they were doing was to get closer to God, yet this man next to them who called himself God, was saying otherwise. Imagine, I'd, I'd be confused. I'd be like, oh, my whole life is a lie. But, you know, their whole life was obsessed by being good people, working hard and doing more. You know, this sounds like a lot of people I know, Christian or not, there's, a, there's almost like a, a worldly view of if I do more, if I do better, if I work really hard and, you know, I've got a good house, I've got a good family, I'm generous, I'm good, you know, I'm a good person, you know, I can, I'm good, I don't kill people, I don't do that kind of stuff, I'm cool, but, oh, but, you know, something, 
we can then always think, oh, but there's something else that I could do or there's something a little bit wrong about me that I would like to change. You know, we go, we go and get counselling. We read uh, self-help books, books that are helping us in that situation. We watch DVDs. We can go to seminars. We can go to all these things. Sometimes we even, you know, I know someone that's Googled something. This is what, I'm feeling slightly depressed. What does this mean? You know, we go to Google. We, we ask something hoping that something will just pop up. And we'll be able to read it and go, great, that's what's wrong with me. Now I can fix it. But just because we try really, really hard and just because we're trying to do all of these things doesn't make us an incredible person that we think God must be proud of me. You know, he doesn't look at us and go, I'm proud of you because you went and you found the answer yourself, you went and helped yourself, and now you're a better person. It doesn't work like that. He's proud of us regardless. He, he loves us and he's proud of us for just being us. Now, when you put it like that, it kind of, I, well, I feel like I have tried to fix myself in the past without even realising. You know, instead of carrying Jesus' burden, we carry our own. It gets us confused and unsure of what's, what's wrong because we think the burden that we're carrying is light. And all of those things we do, we read books, we go to seminars, they're all good things. They really are. But they can never replace the time that we spend just with God. You know, all the time that we go trying to help ourselves, we go and read this book and we try and do this. God's saying, just come to me. Just come to me first. Read my word. Read the absolutes. Know who I am and I will help you. I will give you my burden to carry, which is much lighter than yours. Now, we get caught up about when we have to serve, what team we're going to serve on, the amount of time and effort involved around serving. We can tell other people we're serving God and not people, that it's a privilege. But then we go home and either complain about it or complain about how tired we are or, you know, oh, my gosh, I just, I'm on again, you know. We do all this stuff. And we've kind of added our own rules to God's law. Now, when we add our own rules of I have to serve this many times or I have to serve in this team or I can't serve on that team for whatever reason, you know, that is adding adding to what God said. What God said, you know, serve. That was it. It was no, I would like you to serve here, you, 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 on this many days. There's no roster. You can kind of figure that out. Yes, we've been given gifts and abilities and other areas that we're blessed and, you know, um, incredible and anointed to serve in but what Jesus said was just serve let's just serve people so I think when we add these we really miss the point of why we're actually serving you know Jesus is the point everything that has been done in the past everything that is happened Jesus is the point of that now the Israelites were going on about all of these rules and they were trying and trying and trying to, you know, abide by them and get closer and closer to God. But then when Jesus came, he was saying, you can find your rest in me. In other words, for me, I am the point. I'm the reason why, you know, you are here. Even though you've been told all of these things, yes, laws are important, but when you go and you try and strive for yourself and when you try and do all of these things for yourself, you're missing the point. So church, let's remember why we do what we do. It's because of Jesus, if you've forgotten. Jesus came to make this life easier, not harder. Yes, we're going to have hard times in our journey with God, but that isn't the intention of Jesus. Jesus is in, he came to make life easier. So let's carry his yoke, not ours, because he's already replaced it for us. Yes. Who's the point? Jesus is the point. He's the point of everything. Wow. Hey, church. Um, I'm just reflecting back on that song, Let It Be Jesus. What a great song that was. You know, I'm um, going to share another point. I'm loving this series, Jesus Is. Jesus is our advocate. Jesus is, who can remember? Our friend. Jesus is? The point. The point. Woo. Yes, he is. And uh, I'm going to try and get into this evil, demonic 
thing called technology. And uh, because mine just died, so now I have to use Tara's one, hence the flower cover. You know, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> can I get an amen? <laughs> Um, and so I am going to get straight into this. Um, you know, we, we read in, in, in Luke 15 about the Pharisees, and we're hearing a little bit about the Pharisees and religious teachers and, uh, and these ones. And they came to Jesus, and Jesus tells them the story. It says, Luke 15, verse 1. I'm going to go really fast, all right? So strap your seatbelt in. We're going on a ride. We're getting there quick. Ben, can I get an amen? Those who love speed, um, maybe not. Okay, now I'm just embarrassing myself. Sorry about that. So turn with me to Luke 15, verse 1, and it says, The tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. He was a pretty good teacher. Notorious, I love that word, notorious sinners. That's like, this is bad people. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful Evil, bad people, and even eating with them. You know, in this time, to eat with someone was a process. You know, we kind of duck out and maybe we pick up someone in a car and we run down to, to maybe KFCs. Ooh, maybe not KFCs, maybe something, maybe Subway. Let's call it Subway, hey? And, you know, we get, a, we get a, what, we, what we call fast food. But in this time, a meal was a process. You know, to, to sit down and eat with someone, they'd, they'd be break, baking the bread, kneading it, and going through that process of killing the, killing the animal or cutting its leg off and then roasting. And then, it was a, pro- ooh, and everybody's lips just like a, mmm, that's just delicious. Pig turning with an apple in its mouth, roasting on that. Well, no, well, not a pig because they were Jews, of course. So <laughs> let's just, let's just back, backtrack that. The sheep turning and roasting with it. What, what, what do you do with sheep? I don't know. They rub rosemary on it. And, mm, delicious. How many people are looking forward to Christmas dinner? Yeah, can I get an amen? That's going to be my catch cry through this whole message. So, so this was a process. These people, if Jesus was going to sit down, it was a, it was a whole commitment. No, he would commit his afternoon. He would commit hours to spending time with this person. And these religious, these Pharisees are looking at Jesus thinking, What's this guy? He's, he's devoting so much of his time to sit down and to eat with them. To eat is to spend. It's to say, I want to build relationship with you. I want to be in your world. I want to be in your circle. And you know, these religious people, they are sane. They're looking at Jesus thinking, but we're doing everything right here. We're following the law. We're doing everything that, that needs to be done. We, we're following it to the T to the best of our ability. And, and they, they're looking at Jesus thinking, I don't understand. Well, if you're claiming to be God, then how can you, what's going on with this? And, and Jesus gives them these three stories to illustrate his point. He gives them the story of, and how many people know this, the, 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 the farmer, the shepherd, who has these, 90, these, these hundred sheep in his fold. And he leaves these 99 sheep and he goes out to chase the one. He leaves 99 behind and he goes out in the danger of wolves and and, and foxes and you name it. He leaves and he goes out to chase the one. He goes on and he tells us the story of this woman who's got these 10 coins. These, let's just for a second pretend that they're not even just like 20 cents. Let's just pretend they're they're the small goldies, okay? Let's just say, okay, these these are like, she's got 20 bucks here in these 10 gold coins, and she loses this one coin, and, and she, she turns her house upside down, and she, she, she throws it up in disarray, and she's tossing this here and tossing this there. And at the end, she finds her coin, and she calls her friends in and says, Come, rejoice with me. I found my $2. Think about the logic of this story for a second. Think about the madness of this story for a second. So we need to look at this, that if there is a God, and if there is this, and he is perfect, and he is righteous, and he is holy, and I'm sure this is what these Pharisees were thinking. We know God to be perfect, and holy, and righteous, and why would he be interested in bad people? Why would he be interested in notorious people? And we need to ask ourselves this question today. People are asking themselves, and we need to ask us, if there is a God, yes, there is a God, why would he be interested in bad people? 
You know, we read about Jesus and he hung around with those who were sick and the lepers who were outcast and those who were down, downtrodden and neglected in society. But you know what? He also just hung around with criminals. He also just hung around with the prostitute who wasn't forced into the sex trade, who actually made a decision to go and live that kind of lifestyle. He also hung around with these ones like, like Zacchaeus who he, took, he said, come down from the tree and I'll have lunch. This was a tax killer, someone who would steal and cheat to make an extra living for his life. Jesus also hung around with these notorious people. And then he goes on and he tells us the story about this son, the prodigal son. And let's just flick over there. I'm just going to read through it really fast. So Luke 15, and it says, to illustrate this point, for, uh, never mind, um, from verse 13, a few days later, his young, uh, a few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant, oh man, wait, yeah, we're picking it up from verse 13. Let me, um, sorry, where am I? Here we are, verse 12, there we go. The younger son told his father this, I want my share of your estate now before you, before you die. So his father agreed to divide. Everybody say divide. His wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted. Everybody say wasted. All his money in wild living. About that time, his money ran out. Everybody say ran out. Everybody say, oh. A great famine swept across the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his field to feed the pigs. The man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. And everybody say anything. anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants, even the slaves, even those who they have enough food to spare, and here I am, eating pig food, pig slop, I will go home to my father and I'll work out this and I will say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as one of your hired servants. So he returned home to his father and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran, everybody say ran. Everybody say ran. And he embraced his son. Everybody say embrace. And he kissed him. Everybody say kissed him. I won't say turn to your neighbor and kiss them, but it's okay. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer to be called your son. Before he could even get the words out. His father said, quick, bring the finest robe that is in this house and place it on him. Get the biggest, shiniest ring and place it on his finger and the nicest Nike airs that you can find. <laughs> and tie them onto his shoes. For this son of mine was dead. Everybody say dead. dead. But now he has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is. Everybody say yeah. found. Can I get an Amen. And so the party began. Ephesians 2.8 says, God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that I have done, that I cannot boast, that you cannot boast, that no man can boast in it. To make it simple, to make it clear to you, you were saved by grace. That is it. You cannot pay God back. You cannot earn it. You cannot buy it. It is a free gift. Here's a question. Everybody asks this question. I don't care how long you've been a Christian for, how long you've been walking with the Lord. Everybody asks it. We might not verbalize it, but we go through times in our life where we ask this question, how much am I worth? How much am I worth? How much am I worth? Well, I'm a highly educated young individual. My last 10 assignments, all A's. No, wait, they don't do A's anymore. It's like, I don't know, what is it? What's the a, what's a top? A d the distinction? A high, a high distinction? What am I worth? Well, you should see my bank account. Gosh. Have you looked at this figure? What am I worth? You've got to see my Facebook status and how many friends are on my page. What am I worth? Well, I own 
three houses, four boats, six cars. What am I worth? Nobody says this stuff out loud, but it goes through our mind. What am I worth? What value is on my life? We look at social status and we look at all these things. What am I worth? We look at wealth and assets and intellect and we stand in the mirror and glance at ourselves and make ourselves what we're trying to put value on. What am I worth? Nobody says this out loud, but it's a question we all ask ourselves. It's something we all go through. We all have our own criteria. Ironically enough, the prevalent answer to this is in relation to our deeds. Well, I'm a good person. I do the right thing. I do right by my fellow man. I do good. I read my Bible. I go to church. What am I worth? Well, who you see? My track record. You couldn't fault it. What am I worth? All these answers, we approach this with the belief, and it's natural to all of us, that worth is earned. When we start addressing this, we begin to, Build the sense that worth is earned. Well, if I could only, well, look at what I've done. Well, the Pharisees and the religious teachers of the law and all these ones that would come around Jesus, and they looked at life the same way, that worth is earned. And so here they are. These guys are, it's logical. It makes sense. One plus one equals two if I. And so they're living out their life. They're following the rules. They're doing all the right thing. And they're looking at Jesus and saying, Jesus, you need to be hanging out with us. We're worthy of your time. Can't you see our lives? Look at how we've been following. Look at what we've been doing. And you're hanging out with these ones? It's illogical. It doesn't make sense. We're worth more of your time. You're hanging out with these scum, these cheats, these crooks. And Jesus gives them these stories. This guy, this farmer, leaves 99 of his sheep. You know, I may not be a smart man, (laughs) Boris, Boris Gump. Well, I may not be a smart man, but I know what 99 is. And I know that 99 is more than one. How's my Forrest Gump voice, all right? I know that 99 is a greater value than what one is. If I had one of something and you had 99, I would say you have more than me. Rocket science? No. I mean, you think about this lady tossing her house upside down. Can you imagine her husband? Come on, honey. It's just, it's just a dollar. Just let it go. <laughs> when we get my wallet, I'll replace it. You've still got nine dollars. You've still got nine coins. Now we've got to sort our whole house out. Goodness me. But the point is, these stories are not about a shepherd. They're not about a lady. They're not about a father. They're about God. These illustrations are about God. The fact that God is illogical when it comes to people. He never hedges his bets on, 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 on the, uh, and plays it safe. He never hedges his bets. He'll leave 99 and he'll chase after one. He'll throw a house in disarray just to find that one coin. Why do I hang out with these sinners? Why do I hang out with these tax collectors? Because to me, they're worth of infinite value. Infinite value. See, this is the illustration that Jesus is doing. It's amazing. Jesus places, in in giving these stories, he places a value. He puts an equation on it. He says, can't you see? Look at this story. It won't make sense. It doesn't make sense. The value is infinite. It's infinity. And we all do this. Well, what does it cost? Well, hey, just have a look at the tag. Well, this one must be better because it's worth more, because it costs more. And in giving these stories, Jesus places this this, this value, he places this equation on what humanity is worth to him. It's illogical, it's ridiculous, nobody operates like this, except I do, says Jesus. Pharisees are scratching their head, they they won't understand these parables in that time. Pharisees, why would he leave 99 again? It doesn't make sense. It's illogical. And when people truly encounter that Jesus, when people truly encounter that God, 
their life doesn't make sense. Well, hang on, you mean Mother Teresa, you're going to spend your life in the streets of Calcutta risking your life? It doesn't make sense. It's illogical. But she encountered God. She encountered this God. Now, a sheep and a coin, you know, you can kind of understand they're dumb. They're, uh, a sheep are just like the stupidest animals. And it's, uh, I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that God, like, calls us sheep. But anyway, sheep, sheep do, do silly things. A coin, yeah, a coin is a coin, right? So a coin, a coin can be lost. To, you know, it's probably the lady's fault. Well, it would have been the lady's fault that the coin was lost anyway. But when he tells the story of the sun, it's something we can relate to. It's something that something changes here in the story. You see, the sun made his own decision. The sun made his own choice. He made his own, his own choice to, to walk away. And when he comes back, he doesn't come back. It, it almost went, went, and I'm sure when the Pharisees were hearing the story and the thing, well, the sun's returned. And they imagined and painted the scenario of what was going to happen to the son before Jesus began to tell him. It's not like he came back with an Oxford degree. It's not like he came back with all that money that his father gave him. You know, he invested it, he multiplied it, he made it so much more, and he's coming back to the house, and, and his father's going to receive him and, and embrace him. Wow, look what you've... No, on the contrary, it's quite the opposite. The son comes back and wallowed it all away completely gone, and a party is thrown for him? And at this time, the Pharisees are thinking, what the? They're hearing the story, thinking, you said what, Jesus? He's embraced. Now, the the older son, I can understand him. He, he, He was doing the right thing. But this guy brought shame on his family. He brought shame and embarrassment on his dad. And there is only one answer that why Jesus would want to hang out with these people, these sinners, these criminals, these thieves, these ones. There is only one answer why Jesus would want to hang out with these people. And here's the answer, himself. Jesus would want to hang out with them because of himself. See, the shepherd, the lady, the father, they all go through this process. They search, they find, they recover, and then they celebrate. They celebrate. The whole process is, is irrational. Jesus hangs out with, with these ones. He's telling these, he's telling these religious leaders, these Pharisees, I hang out with these ones because, because I am grace. Because Jesus is grace. He's the essence of grace. See, worth is not earned. It's not earned through a process. It's not earned by what we can do. Salvation is not earned. It is only ever received. Just like everything else that, that, that is in the, about the kingdom, grace is, it is only received. Worth is only received. It is received. That's, that's really the problem for most of humanity. You mean I can't? No, you can't. You mean there's nothing I can? No, there isn't. You mean I've just got it? Yeah, you can't. Well, I can't do that. Yeah, it's, well, then we have a dilemma. <laughs> Because you can't earn it, you can't fight for it, you can't, you can only receive it. It's the problem for most of humanity. We can't get past this whole de- deal. We're, we're logical in our mind, cause and effect, A plus B, because it has to be in order and doesn't make sense. We are saved by grace, Ephesians 2.8. We are saved by grace. Don't you dare take one ounce of credit for this transformation that God has for you. Grace is God meeting man at his very point in need. So you cannot find your way to God. We can't find our way to God. And religion would, would, would be humanity trying to find their way to God. And we use all sorts of things, all the isms in life to try and find our way to God, try and find our way to get there. But how many people know how to use a compass? When I saw that thing, I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Am I going this way? I mean, is it pointing in the direction I'm going? Uh, man, I've got to use Google Maps if I've got to go down the street. We can't find our way anywhere. God has to find us. God finds us. See, worth cannot be gained by the world we live in, but by the image that we are created in. 
In Genesis 1.26, it says, Let us make man in our image. Our worth comes from the image that we are created in. You are created in the image of God himself. That is where our worth comes from. God cannot deny himself. It is, it's got nothing to do with how good we are. It's got nothing to do with, with how much we've achieved. He's not moved by how, how smart you are. He's not moved by how many homes you have. He's not moved by how much is in your bank account. He's not moved by how many friends are on your list. He's not moved by anybody. He's only moved by himself, by his image in you. And so he will do whatever he has to do. He will move heaven and earth. He He will leave the 99 and go after the one. He will throw the house in disarray to redeem his image. To redeem his image in you. Isn't that amazing? So you are his image bearer of infinite value. Your worth was given to you before you were even born. And so you cannot devalue it. No matter what you try, no matter what you do, no matter what you go through in life, no matter how down you get, you cannot devalue the value that God has on you. Worth is not earned, contrary to popular popular, popular opinion. It's only ever received, just like everything else in the kingdom of God. It can only be received. This is good news, yeah? I mean... You know, this coming Christmas, I think I'm so looking forward to it because at Christmas, those of you who have children, we get to see the whole gospel reenacted again. And I'm not talking the nativity scene on Christmas Eve service or whatever the case is. I'm talking when we sit down with our, pre- with our kids and they receive that present, they go to their eyes, big as saucers you've ever seen. Mom, Dad, wow. You mean this is from you, Mom and Dad? Oh, wow, what a bike. Oh, hey, I'll pay you back for it. <laughs> you remember hearing that? No. Because it was just received. No expectation. No strings attached. It's just received. <laughs> so good. I mean, this, there's no other message like this, church. Religion would put all sorts of strings on things. Well, hey, you know, you... No, it's just received. It's amazing. You know, even the disciples really struggled with this. I mean, they hung around with Jesus all the time. They were like, they were, they were living in his world, man. They were like, I'd say they were in his pockets, but Jesus just like, he probably didn't really buy stuff. He just, you know, he just made it. <laughs> they were in his world and they still struggled with this. And how do people remember that story where, where, where these parents are wanting to bring their kids to Jesus, and and the and the disciples are there and saying, "Hey, no, wait, no, just push those. So we've got more important things to do here. No, no, no. We don't have time for the little children right now. There are so many things that are of more value that we need to get to right now. Jesus, don't you? We've got this because in their minds, there's a worth scale." Well, they're just children, they so many more important things to do. Hang on a second. And Jesus says, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. Let the children come to me. And in fact, here, let me give you a lesson. You better get what they've got because you can't inherit the kingdom of God unless you receive it like these children. Whew, wow. Jesus says, assuredly, I tell you, hang on, listen up. Disciples, this is an important point right here. Unless you receive it like these little children, you will not receive the kingdom of heaven. So let the little children come. And let their lives speak to you that it doesn't matter what they're worth in the eyes of man. Because in the eyes of God, in my eyes, they're of infinite value. And I want to hold them, and I want to embrace them, and I want to love them. 
And you know, God wants to embrace you. God wants to hold you. God wants to hold me. And you know what we do? We're just like that son. We've got our speech worked out. Father, I've sinned against. And we come and, and the father's holding us and we're trying to, I've sinned against you. And wait, you've got to hear my speech. And I've been living with the pigs. And the father said, I just want to hold you. I just want to hold you. And we're trying to fight our way out and say, but haven't you seen what I've, can't you see what I, no, just receive my grace. Just receive my grace. Just receive my grace. I just want to hold you. You know, there's nothing that you could ever have done. There's nothing that you will ever do. To trump the grace of Jesus, our Savior. It doesn't matter how many times you've been on the drink. It doesn't matter how many times you've got yourself, but I just I gotta stop gossiping, God. I'm just I know when I get when I start talking that way, I'm just God, I'm just me and my girlfriend, we keep slipping up. I just God wants to hold you. Embrace you because you cannot devalue what God has valued. And we fight God and we fight God and we fight God, and He just wants to hold us. I wonder, would you close your eyes, bow your heads with me this morning? God, I thank you for sending Jesus, for revealing yourself to humanity. In the person of Jesus, Jesus, I thank you that you are grace, that you are this, uh, that, oh God, I'm just lost for words at who you are. You're amazing, Lord. You blow our mind. You're the point. You're the reason. You are everything, Jesus. And God, I'm sorry when I've been struggling and fighting and trying to earn it and trying to win it and trying to get approval and this and that and the other. And God, I don't just rest in 